All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. The closing keynote for day two of First Con. Uh, just a few quick reminders before we get started. Everyone has been muted. Uh, if you are using the event app, we encourage you to check into the session, update your activities, and be sure to complete the session survey. Um, if you are having any issues with the app, please email us at events at first.org so we can help you out. This session is TLP White and is being recorded. Recordings will be available within 24 hours via the app or the desktop mobile site. And with that, I'd like to introduce to you our program chair for 2020 and your session moderator, uh, Lucy Mara Desidera. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, um, I am Lucy, the first Count 20 Program Committee Chair, and uh, welcome to the grand finale of day two. So our today's keynote is someone whose job over the last six years has impacted not only our work as defenders, but also the IT industry and its users probably. I'm delighted to introduce Ben Hawks, a founding member and technical lead of Google's Project Zero security research team. Um, at Project Zero, Ben helped develop the team's mission, strategy, and vulnerability disclosure policies. And as a researcher, he discovered many vulnerabilities across a range of different software platforms. And this presentation, Ben will bring uh, core aspects of the vulnerability disclosure debate and provide insights based on Project Zero's experience. Please don't forget to make your questions using the Q&A tool and Zoom. And uh, Ben, the floor is yours. Excellent, thanks, Lucy. Uh, right, so yeah, I'm the technical lead for, for Project Zero, the security research team at Google. And first of all, thank you, uh, a big thank you to the first conference organizers for inviting me to speak today about Project Zero's experiences with vulnerability disclosure. So this talk is called Project Zero's Disclosure Philosophy. Uh, and I wanted to, to share that with you all since I think we have a pretty unique perspective on this topic. And I know that at times our perspective has been perhaps a bit surprising or unintuitive to, to some of you who are familiar with this work. Um, so what I wanted to do is, is dive into the topic and really examine the fundamental challenges that we face when creating a vulnerability disclosure policy. And then based on that, I think we'll be in a better position to actually describe and assess what Project Zero's actual approach to vulnerability disclosure is. And then in the end, I wanna give sort of one concrete suggestion that I hope will lead to, to better outcomes for, for user security and, and perhaps even a few less contentious debates about vulnerability disclosure. But first, I, I wanted to briefly take a step back and uh, talk about my team, Project Zero, and why I think we, we do have this unique perspective on this topic of vulnerability disclosure. So we were founded, uh, as Lucy said, back in 2014 uh, with the, the team mission to make zero day hard, uh, a zero day being uh, a vulnerability that attackers know about, but the defenders don't know about. And make zero day hard, that implies that zero days are too cheap and too numerous in proportion to their capability for attackers. And importantly, something unique about Project Zero is that we want to make Zero Day hard for everybody, not just for those who are using Google's products directly. So we decided to focus on all types of important ubiquitous software uh, and hardware, ranging from things like mobile to web browsers, operating systems, cloud systems, and, and so on. And to achieve all of this, we created a, a pipeline of work based around attack research or offensive security research, essentially replicating the process of a real attacker, but with a, a defensive mission in mind. So we create tools and methodologies that can be used to surface critical security bugs in the software that we all rely on. Uh, and then for some proportion of those discoveries, we actually attempt to write an exploit for them, just as a, a, as a real attacker would attempt to do. And then the two main differences between our work and, and a real attacker is that uh, firstly, obviously we try to report and help fix all of the vulnerabilities that we find. Uh, but secondly, we also try to use the insights that we derive from this attack research process to, to drive longer term structural improvements to security. Uh, 
And that's things like better sandboxing or uh, fixing a, an entire bug class, exploit mitigations, uh, even things like process improvements and improved, improved testing, fuzz testing, et cetera. So as a result of this, over the past six years, we've helped to fix over 1,800 unique vulnerabilities. And that's, I guess, the crux of the topic we're discussing today. So vulnerability disclosure is about how do you communicate the discovery of a vulnerability? How do you get that vulnerability fixed? And how do you inform the public about it? And we've had to communicate a lot of vulnerabilities. So on average, we're publishing the, the technical details of about five to six bugs per week. Uh, and that means we've built up a huge amount of experience with vulnerability disclosure. And uh, we've seen just about everything that there is to see. Um, and quite consistently, I'd say throughout the past, uh, past few years, our decisions about disclosure have been scrutinized. Uh, you might say critiqued. Sometimes we talk about the, the vulnerability disclosure debate. Um, and quite frankly, at, at times managing the disclosure process can be a bit stressful. Um, I think um, certainly I was stressed when I wrote this tweet around Spectre and Meltdown, um, but I think that there is a great sense of responsibility to users. Um, and when you combine that with the knowledge that your, your actions are, are gonna be held up to a microscope, particularly when uh, things go wrong, uh, and then it's nearly impossible to please everybody in the, uh, in, in the, uh, in the, in the world. Um, but where does this sort of feeling come from? Um, frankly, this phenomenon of a, a disclosure debate isn't new. The, the, the debate has been fairly intense since at least the, the late 80s. Um, and working through the, the timeline here from the, the left, we started out with sort of invite only private vulnerability sharing clubs that might sound familiar to some of you in the first ecosystem. Um, things like the Zardos Security Digest mailing list, um, or a bit later we had Vendorsec for um, sort of Linux related issues. We had to be invited to join uh, a private mailing list and then you would share information about vulnerabilities. Then from there, we threw that sort of the 90s, we had the advent of full disclosure and the, sort of the arrival of the bug track mailing list and sort of reaction to this, this private sharing club. Um, and then fast forward a bit, we have um, Microsoft's infamous memo called uh, It's Time to End Information Anarchy. Um, and that's where sort of like the sort of demands for, for so-called responsible disclosure, as it was called then, came in. Now it might be called coordinated vulnerability disclosure. And that's when essentially the vendors were asking for the ability to set the timeline for publication of the patch and the details on their own, not the researcher, the vendor would set the timeline. Um, around that same time, perhaps not so much in reaction to, um, to responsible disclosure, but sort of just a related thread of thought, we had somewhat of a, a radical reaction from a segment of the hacker community who called for non-disclosure policies to essentially never report or publish information about how attacks worked. Um, then we sort of had this burgeoning marketplace of, uh, of vulnerability information as so the demand for this knowledge increased, both in public markets like uh, exploit competitions and, and bug bounties, uh, but also certainly there's been a huge growth in, in the private markets, the gray markets and black markets for exploits. And then finally, uh, toward the, the end there, we have the sort of first serious adoption of something called disclosure deadlines by Google. And that's essentially the precursor to Project Zero's current disclosure policy. So it's a long winding path to where we're at today. And throughout all of this time, certainly we debated back and forth about which disclosure process was the best. And I think it's fair to say that 30 years later, the debate is still as fierce as ever. Uh, but why is there a debate about this at all? Why is it so hard to agree on the best way to handle a vulnerability once you've found it? Because on the surface, it doesn't seem like a very difficult problem. Um, but alas, if you dig deeper, it, it does somewhat make sense that there's so much disagreement about disclosure. There's three reasons why. Imperfect data, conflicting models, and divergent goals. So let's 
quickly dive into each of these root issues so that hopefully we can understand a bit more about the challenges we face when trying to agree on a disclosure policy. So in perfect data, uh, what we know is that security is fundamentally adversarial. So that means that attackers are incentivized to deprive us of the data that we need to make the best decisions possible in defense. In fact, you could even say that attackers are incentivized to actively mislead us about what they're working on. So I think if we always had perfect knowledge of which vulnerabilities were being used, by whom and against whom, then we'd actually be able to solve the disclosure debate almost immediately. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't think we can really hope to achieve that perfect level of insight. It's not realistic. Um, and in fact, what little data we do have about how exploits are actually used, either as a zero day or as what we might call a one day, so an opportunistic attack once the bug is known, um, that data is by definition a failure case for the attacker. And so in statistics, we know that you can't really rely on just the failure cases alone. Um, that data is, is non-representative. So when we say that the data is imperfect, we're really saying that if you make decisions in security only based on the data about attackers that you have available to you, then by definition, that's a suboptimal decision. So in order to account for this, we need to introduce some sort of model that accounts for the data that we don't see. In other words, we need to build a model for attacker behavior. And so concretely, that means building some sort of description of the different classes of attacker, the different types of attacker that are active at any given moment. And so that means estimating their overall resources. It means describing their, their capabilities, their motivations, constraints, it means uh, understanding how the attacker prioritizes their work their level of risk tolerance, where their funding comes from, their ability to, to do in-house research and development versus having to outsource a lot of the technical work and so on. And it means doing all of this with a global perspective. And I think this is something that security professionals, uh, I think this is something that security professionals do intuitively. Um, here, we're more specifically talking about some sort of process that's deliberate and inspectable. You can't really reason about something that can't be described. Um, but the key point is that uh, there's so many unknown variables at play behind these models and how we create them, that there's a wide variety of like legitimate, le legitimately justifiable approaches and models that you can choose. And so since there's a wide range here, that can lead to substantial conflicts in the disclosure policy discussion. So for example, take the question, uh, will this new proof of concept that was released today, will this proof of concept be repurposed by opportunistic attackers in the month following disclosure? And depending on your model, you might say, yes, almost certainly it will, or no, almost certainly it won't, or something in between. And where you fall on these questions, questions of this type, um, that will radically affect your preferences and choices regarding disclosure policy. Um, but even, even if we were to say that uh, we agreed on, on, on the set of data that's available and, and how to interpret that data, we still then run into some problems in terms of the motivations and the goals of defenders. Because um, it's fair to say that the goals of defenders are just as broad as those of attackers. And what that means is that when we diverge in priorities and goals, I think so too does our understanding of what we're actually trying to optimize for, like what is optimal disclosure. Um, so here are a couple of the, the most common dimensions where this divergence can occur. And I think there certainly are more than two dimensions here, but this is perhaps a common way to think about it the balancing and weighting of, of user harm versus business priorities, and the balancing and weighting of short-term risks and outcomes versus long-term risks and outcomes. So as a thought exercise, you think about like which of these points represents your organization and then perhaps your own personal values, then which is uh, someone who might be reporting a vulnerability to your organization? Are they the same point roughly or very different? Which one is project zero? 
which one is Google, which one is the Linux kernel upstream community, which one is Apple, Microsoft, and so on. So clearly there isn't always a right and wrong answer for what anyone's goals and priorities should be, uh, but we need to recognize when this divergence is occurring, factor it in and try to communicate our intent as best as we can. And so based on all of that, I think it's clear to me at least that the disclosure debate is, is here to stay. Uh, and that isn't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, we often like to make jokes about this topic, like, oh, are we still talking about this in 2020? And you know, we get frustrated with people for the, the long Twitter threads and all of that. Um, but for those of you that have to make decisions about this, this disclosure topic, and these decisions can affect the security and safety of, of potentially billions of users, it really isn't that trivial. And, and I think this debate is actually important. Um, so fortunately, I do think that there's a, a simple way that we can improve how this debate is happening. And we'll discuss that in just a few minutes. Um, first though, I'd like to, to share some more details about Project Zero's disclosure philosophy. So I wanna talk about the specific choices we've made and, and why we've made them. Um, and I'll preface this by saying that we think we've got a great disclosure policy, certainly, uh, but the point of this section isn't so much to convince you that it's the best. I'd say the goal is more to try and break down the problem space so that you can at least sort of understand the different factors that go into to choosing any specific disclosure policy, whatever that might be. But before you even choose a policy, it's a, it's a good idea to think about some guiding principles. So this is like a general framework for policy making, uh, like an outline of what the policy should sort of feel like once it's all set in place. Um, and we at Project Zero arrived at three guiding principles that we try to sort of weave into all of our policy development work, uh, simple, consistent, and fair. So simple means that a policy should be easy to communicate and easy to operate, easy to work with each day. And so we need a, a simple policy in order to avoid any confusion in our communication. Um, and also in order to be able to scale up our work. I mean, this, this process, this policy has to work for thousands of vulnerabilities, not just one or two. Uh, consistent means that the policy should operate in a predictable way. So the same inputs get the same outputs each time that you run the, the process. Uh, and fair means that no one group or company should be favored over another, that essentially the same rules apply evenly. And it's, I would say, surprisingly difficult to build a disclosure policy that doesn't rely on a lot of subjectivity and a lot of judgment calls. Um, but I would say through hard won experience, um, we would say, and I'd say um, with some certainty that we know it's the best to aim for these principles, even if it's harder to do that, it's worth it in the long run. All right, so what do we actually need to decide when we're sort of crafting or building a, a disclosure policy? Uh, concretely, there are three central questions that we have to answer in order to define a disclosure policy. There's some, my, model for how this works. The first question is when to release the details of the, the vulnerability publicly. And you see sort of a few of the example settings that you might be able to choose, uh, ranging from full disclosure on one end to non-disclosure on the other end. Um, a couple of the more sort of common choices, disclosure deadlines there, T0 plus N, so the, the time of discovery plus some fixed length of time. Um, that's one option or coordinated disclosure is another sort of popular option right now. That's where you take the time of the patch being released and then perhaps add some, some time on from, from patch release. The second question that we need to consider is you know, once we've decided to publish something, what level of technical details should we be publishing? And this ranges, of course, from releasing no details at all, or just some, some high level metadata, um, like in some vendor bulletins, you might just say uh, a bug class and a, a product that was affected, all the way through to releasing full technical details about how the vulnerability works, how it was patched, and how it was successfully exploited. And the final question that uh, we need to consider is who to inform prior to publishing the details publicly. 
in one's details is public. It's uh, somewhat of a moot point, um, unless you're talking about different thresholds of, of information. But we have this, this um, question of what happens prior to disclosure, public disclosure. And of course, typically you would want to tell the upstream owner of the affected component, like whether that's like a software vendor or an open source project, uh, they're in the best position to actually build the official patch for the issue. But there's uh, actually a wide range of other stakeholders as well. And you have to sort of carefully consider the merits of giving each of these parties a, an early heads up about the, the, the disclosure, uh, rather the vulnerability details. And certainly they're all uh, asking for those details. So now I think we have a better framework to describe the actual problem we're trying to solve here. Um, earlier in the presentation, I talked about how hard it is to make optimal decisions in vulnerability disclosure without really defining what I meant. Um, and so here's a basic definition that we can start to use. Optimal disclosure policy is the configuration of these decisions, the when, what, and who, in order to minimize user harm. Um, and here we only have sort of one final thing to define before we can really dive into how we're answering our big three questions. Um, so it says here that we want to minimize user harm, but how do we measure user harm? Because of course we need to be able to measure it in order to know what we're trying to minimize. Um, and it turns out that this is a really challenging problem all of its own. The temptation historically has been to measure user harm by counting the number of affected users. So more compromised users equates to more harm. And we know, I think, that a lot of vendors still think in these terms because they seem to like disproportionately prioritize widespread attacks. It means like untargeted mass exploitation and internet worms and so on. Um, and it seems seemingly intuitive at first glance to, to measure harm in this way by counting the affected users. But we actually believe that this is a subtly incomplete description of what we're actually trying to measure. So here's an example. If we take an exploit that's used for tens of thousands uh, of hosts to install Monero mining software on like right, randomly selected targets on the internet, tens of thousands, compare that with an exploit that's just used a single time, just once, but it's used on a, a high level government official by a foreign adversary with the intent to steal data that can give an upper hand in trade negotiations, for example something that could have like a small but noticeable effect on, on GDP. So even if we were just comparing the dollar value impact of these two compromises, it's clear that the measure of user harm here is deceptively wrong. So that's, I think, because we, we really wanna measure and understand what the real world consequences of each attack, each compromise is. Essentially the, the total societal harm from that compromise. And our central claim here is that while it's relatively easy to count the number of affected users by, by any given attack, it's actually incredibly difficult to reason about the total societal harm from that. Um, the consequence of a, a compromise is not uniform across the population of users. And so the level of harm caused by any given attack, it isn't always clear just on the number of affected users. In some sense, I think this is actually quite an unsatisfying definition uh, because it is inherently subjective. Um, but in Project Zero's disclosure philosophy, um, this is certainly a key idea that, that sort of permeates all of the, the decisions we have to make, both in policy and elsewhere. Um, when we say the word user harm, we can use the term societal harm interchangeably. So now, that we know what we're trying to optimize for, more or less, uh, we can describe finally sort of projects are a specific configuration of our disclosure policy, at least in basic terms. When do we publish a bug? 90 days after reporting it. What do we publish at that time? All of the technical details that we know about, including proof of concept exploits. And who do we tell prior to disclosure? only the affected vendor or open source project that's responsible for developing an official patch, nobody else. So let's dive into each of these aspects in a bit more detail. Let's uh, first consider when to publish. 
So we use a, a 90 day deadline uh, on our vulnerability reports, um, meaning that regardless of whether a fix is available or not, after 90 days, we will make the issue public, publicly available. Um, but why would we want to have a deadline at all? That's the question. So prior to disclosure deadlines, the, the standard approach was, was called this responsible disclosure or coordinated vulnerability disclosure. And that was where the software vendor, uh, whichever vendor was responsible for sort of developing the security patch, they would decide the, the time frame for that patch to be developed and, uh, and released. And unfortunately, the results weren't fantastic. We tried this approach for many, many years, and bugs were regularly taking six months to fix, sometimes over a year. But why does it matter if a security bug takes over a year to fix? Um, I think there are sort of three steps to this argument, so come along with me. Um, firstly, we know that when a vulnerability is known to be exploited in the wild, when there's an active attack and it's been discovered, then an urgent fix is required. I think that's kind of accepted um, in, across industry now. When no one user harm is occurring, we have a responsibility to address that in a timely manner. So that's sort of like step one. Step two uh, is a subtle point. We know that some proportion of Project Zero's discoveries are bug collisions with attackers. Um, at, what that means is that at a certain rate, our discoveries have already been exploited by attackers in secret in a way that nobody knows about. And we've stumbled across the same result as they did. And we know this because I think we're in a pretty unique position of highly public leadership in Project Zero. And I think we have a view into this topic that no one really else has. Um, attackers from all around the world have pretty consistently showed up at our doorsteps after the bug is fixed with some sort of evidence or claims about bug collision. Um, it's a fascinating phenomenon, interesting, really interesting, and it probably won't last too much longer, um, but it has given us sort of the insight we needed to arrive at the, the need for a disclosure deadline. Because um, that's essentially the conclusion is that uh, we need to factor in this reality of bug collision, that at a certain rate, our bugs are already being exploited. And 90 days reflects that. So we're saying here that there's an average case urgency that's somewhat higher than we'll get around to it eventually, um, but somewhat lower than there's a known case of in the wild exploitation. That's, that's 90 days. And I think we're pretty happy with the, the results we've, we've had with this uh, approach. We've gone from a world where just a, a small proportion of our bugs were fixed under 90 days to a world where 98% or thereabouts of our discoveries are, are now fixed within the disclosure deadline. So the lingering question for the when, in my mind, isn't so much whether or not to have a disclosure deadline, um, but rather it's, it's whether we have an opportunity to improve things even further. So looking forward, I think there's no reason why we can't aim for a lower number than 90. Um, what that number might be still remains to be seen, but I think that should be the vision. So moving on, we need to decide what to publish, uh, both in a case where a patch is available and in a case where no patch is available. Right, so uh, at Project Zero, uh, we have decided to share all of our insights about a vulnerability, including proof of concept exploits. Um, so let's first look at some of the, the positive aspects of releasing these details, and then we'll look at the risks. So firstly, um, Full technical details are more actionable than just saying, here's a patch and you should install it. Um, and you might say that, well, most users won't use this information. And I think that's definitely true, but we want to give an opportunity for those users that, that can utilize this data um, or will be influenced by this data or who will use products and services that are using this data. There's an entire ecosystem of defenders that exist outside of the, the closed walls of the big software vendors. We shouldn't forget that. I have a lot of optimism for what defenders can achieve when, when trusted with the raw data like this. And it's often wildly creative and important work. So secondly, we want to share what we've learned about the state of the art and exploit development, because we want to demystify how exploits really work. Um, Exploits are the closest thing to magic we have in the modern world. 
and people connect with that. They respond to that. Um, we want to get our users engaged in this topic. We want our users to understand the power of these exploits and their importance to society. And we want our users to ask questions of the companies that are providing this vulnerable tech to them. So finally, uh, I think we have to plan for the future and to share our knowledge with the, the next generation of, of hackers. It's, I think it's a fundamentally pessimistic worldview to say that if we share that information with the public um, and you know, share this information about how these attacks work, that that will cause more harm than good. I've, I've seen, I would say quite the opposite. And in terms of the number of young researchers that have approached me to say that they were inspired by the Project Zero blog and then it gave them the resources they needed to, to learn this craft. Um, some of them may even be in this audience. Like some of them may be working for your, for your company. Um, and on balance, I think um, that's a, a, a wonderfully positive outcome. And also I would say within the existing community at Project Zero, we, we do have an opportunity to be leaders as well as researchers. And our work we've found sets an agenda for, for a wave of follow-up research, um, take Spectre and Meltdown and all of the wonderful work that's happened as a result of, of that publication. Um, and this follow-up research is pursued by defensive researchers all over the world. And we want to encourage that. We want more of that type of community-based collaboration. And I think sharing our results is the foundation for that community effort. So if you believe in that uh, approach and what can be achieved in that method, we need that, that sharing uh, to, to get it all started. That's the raw ingredients. So I've established, I think, that there is some defensive benefit of releasing these details. Um, but how does it balance against the, the potential risks so obviously exploits can be dangerous. And so surely intuitively releasing more exploits leads to more user harm. Um, it's a subtle point. Um, it certainly has happened that Project Zero's reported vulnerabilities have been picked up and used by opportunistic attackers. We have seen that happen a handful of times, but it doesn't seem to happen very often based on all of the observ observable data on, on one day attacks. Um, of course, as I mentioned, the, the data is incomplete, uh, but you would argue that the, the, the data for known vulnerabilities appears to be a little bit more representative than our data on zero day attacks. What we see in that one day space is, is um, it's not very common that our, our issues have been picked up and used by opportunistic attackers. So why is that? Why isn't our, our research being used in malicious attacks very often? I think the main reason is that there's a mismatch between capabilities and motivation. So remember that, that most of Project Zero's disclosures are one part of an exploit chain. And that in a modern operating system, you often need like three or four or five individual bugs to compromise remotely the, the entire system. It's like due to all the, the sandboxing and exploit mitigations and so on. So you need a, a pretty high level of skill to complete an exploit chain from whatever initial ingredients Project Zero has given you. And if you can do that, if you can complete that exploit chain, uh, you can probably find your own zero day rather than just using one of ours. And from a detection risk perspective, it's, it's clear which of these two options as an attacker you would prefer. Um, so what the, the data does actually suggest is that there are two classes of vulnerabilities that are favored by the, the low skilled opportunistic attackers, the ones that, that can't complete the exploit chain. Um, Firstly, bugs that are trivial to exploit. So we're talking like one shot remote code execution based on a design flaw or a logic bug. Things like the sort of Apache stretches or SharePoint type uh, deserialization bugs that we've seen in recent years. Um, unfortunately, like the, the exploit payloads for those are trivial. They can be reversed out of the patch generally pretty easily. Um, the second sort of class of, of issue, and this is a, again, a subtle point, bugs that were originally detected as being exploited in the wild as a zero day are being used at a higher rate in opportunistic attacks than normal CVEs. I think that's because either um, a fully sort of productized exploit capability leaks, uh, like we saw WannaCry and NotPetya using the Eternal Blue exploit, 
um, or because there's a higher level of social proof that a particular CVE is, is worth it to invest in for, for whatever capability there is to do that investment. Um, and the vast majority of cases, Project Zero isn't releasing either two of these categories. So overall, our conclusion is that the openness here benefits defenders more than attackers. So we're saying we have a neutral effect on attacker capability and a positive effect on defender capability. And I think this represents a fundamentally optimistic worldview, but, but one that's also grounded in reality based on our experience with, with exploit development and, and vulnerability disclosure. So we look at the data, we work on our models for attacker behavior, and this is the, the conclusion, the results. So now our final decision, uh, the, the common scenario is this. You find a critical security bug and a piece of code that's used throughout the internet. Who should you tell? And for Project Zero, the answer is that we have um, a policy to only report the issue to the party that's responsible for developing and releasing the patch. So in other words, um, once we've validated the a vulnerability exists and we're ready to report it, we tell the minimum necessary number of people required to build the official security patch. And in our experience, this gets the best results. Uh, it allows us to, to focus on the engineering task at hand, working with the vendor to build a correct and comprehensive patch um, with the minimum number of distractions. So what we've found is that as you expand the set of people who are involved, the more complicated the coordination effort becomes. And you start to take on a lot of excess risk. So let's dive into that a bit more. The question is, wouldn't it be ideal if we could tell a small group of defenders about the security bug at the same time as the upstream vendor? So in that ideal world, you'd be able to, to do this, to share the, the information about the threats and the vulnerabilities so that they can get started uh, working on the issue as soon as possible. But the, the reality is very different. So concretely, these efforts to create a, a sharing club for vulnerabilities, they have consistently leaked. And I'm not talking about just public leaks here. I'm talking about like the, the more insidious kind of leak where attackers have gained access to the embargo, but the embargo members are unaware. And it's happened time and time again in history, going all the way back to the, the Zardos security mailing list we talked about in our, our timeline earlier, where the mailing list was like a favorite target of hackers seeking to gain special knowledge of the, the vulnerabilities being discussed there. And it happened again to the VendorSec mailing list, the same concept in the early 2000s. It's happened to Microsoft's MAP antivirus sharing program. And I suspect it's happened to Project Zero bug reports in the past as well, like Spectre and Meltdown, for example, I have my suspicions. And the list of potential risk goes on. Uh, we've noticed that there's a certain behavior that happens in these vulnerability sharing clubs where members are, are somewhat eager, perhaps desperate to maintain their membership in the club. And so they don't want to rock the boat. And that means that the, the timelines trend towards the demands and needs of the slowest members of the group with very little pushback. And so in a world where we're trying to decrease the, the vulnerability remediation timeline, I find this quite counterproductive and indeed quite frustrating. So there's a question of incentives as well. And this is more of a, a long-term view We've seen that people rely on these, these vulnerability sharing clubs as type of like a, a band-aid type solution. Um, but really we need structural improvements to how vulnerabilities are, are patched and, and how those patches are adopted by users. And these sharing clubs seem rather to entrench the current technologies, the current processes, and we want to overhaul and improve those processes rather than entrench them. And finally, of course, there's the issue of fairness. Um, the, the process to decide who's included and excluded is, is, is also typically quite inconsistent and unfair. And we don't really want to be in a position to pick winners and losers. So overall, we think it's a, a better idea to work directly with vendors to get an official patch out in a timely manner. And then for the wider ecosystem to respond to the security advisories when the patch is ready. So that's how we arrived at the answers for our big three questions, trying to achieve a, a policy that's optimized for user security, but also simple, consistent, and fair. 
Uh, but I wanted to, to quickly point out that even with all of our best efforts to treat vulnerabilities fairly under our disclosure policy, there's always going to be extreme edge cases where things go quite differently. Uh, and I think it's fascinating to inspect those extremes to see what can be learned. So here are, are two examples that had quite radically different outcomes. Firstly, um, a couple of weeks ago, we discovered and reported a vulnerability in FreeType, a font library, and it was being actively exploited in the wild against Chrome users. So we reported the bug to Chrome security. One day later, there was a new Chrome stable release with the fix included and a new version of the FreeType library the day after that. It's pretty amazing. At the other extreme, Project Zero discovered and reported the CPU vulnerabilities known as Spectre and Meltdown. And that involved uh, an industry-wide embargo that we were brought into somewhat reluctantly, um, involving a, a huge number of organizations, CPU vendors, the hardware OEMs, operating system vendors, browser vendors, and more. It's like a lot of people. And it took 216 days between nearly over seven months um, between our initial bug report and the first public release of details. And over seven months and that embargo leaked and the patches at the end of it were only partially complete. So obviously the, the, the complexity involved in these two responses is quite different on, on multiple levels. But I think the point is that we should be working on decreasing the distance between these two cases. I think it'll be interesting to revisit this exercise, let's say in like 10 years time, because I think the distance is actually closing and one day we'll have a reasonable shot at responding to bugs like Spectre in days rather than months. I think that's the goal. So certainly there's, there's cause for optimism. Uh, and certainly I think the 90 day disclosure deadline itself isn't as controversial as it once was, uh, but we still have some big challenges in, in disclosure and here's uh, a few that have been on my mind in, in 2020. Firstly, um, while the patch timelines have improved a lot, patch correctness is still a problem. Like the rate of, of broken or incomplete patches is very high. Um, and we've been finding a lot of variants, and this is pretty concerning because we know that attackers are looking for these variants as well. So secondly, uh, while we had um, some success recently with the free type bug and others, um, as a whole, I think the industry response to actively exploited zero day vulnerabilities, those, those are zero days that we know are being used in the wild, I think it needs a little bit more work. The, the, the outcomes are very inconsistent at the moment. So it's fair to say that there's less industry consensus around how to handle dis disclosure for actively exploited bug reports. Uh, and that's something we've committed to working on in, in 2021. So finally, uh, we said earlier that exploits are magic, but people fear magic. And so what we see is that there's like a growing amount of pressure to withhold or stop publishing proof of concept exploits at all or particularly at any time close to a patch is released. And I suspect that this is gonna be a longer discussion uh, that plays out over the next few years, but I wanted to share my fundamental fear is that in a world where we can't publish information about how exploits really work, then the private state of the art and exploit development will move so far ahead of the public understanding of it that we'll just never be able to catch up again. I think that divergence would be really scary. But let's focus on the, the here and now. Um, and I promise to finish with a, a simple idea that I think can improve the disclosure debate. So let's return to our, our three core reasons for the debate um, and look at where we might make some progress. I think imperfect data is hard to solve. Uh, perhaps we can improve like the level of information sharing, surfacing more data um, that might be possible. Um, divergent goals I think is also hard. I think we have to accept that different people have, have different motivations, accept and move on. So it's in the area of conflicting models. I think we can make some quick uh, improvements. And the, the answer is qualitative forecasting, also known as making predictions and keeping score. And really it's the work of uh, Ryan McGeehan on his Medium blog that has been the, the catalyst for me to realize the importance of this approach. Uh, he ran a few different studies that used expert panels 
to forecast outcomes related to vulnerability disclosure. And I thought the results were fascinating. So here's an example for the Blue Keep vulnerability. He asked a group of experts the question, will exploitation of Blue Keep be observed by the security community in the wild? Then he tracked the panel's accuracy in making these predictions. So why is this important? Um, this is essentially a test of the panel participants' model for attacker behavior. That the more accurate their model of the world is, the more accurate their predictions will be. So it gives us a, a structured way to bridge the gap between our different conflicting models of attacker behavior. And the results were, I think, fascinating um, because it, for me, showed that security experts weren't making very accurate forecasts at all. That the, the predictive power of the panel was little better than like an even odds guess on each outcome. So here's our one suggestion for the path forward to improving the disclosure debate make predictions and keep score. So let's take Ryan's initial work and scale it up. Let's get more people involved in this and let's make it a regular thing. Um, this is a, a new goal we have and, and something that we're uh, exploring in Project Zero and looking at funding, but the pandemic has slowed this down a little bit. Uh, but I'm happy to say that the initial interest is um, very high and we're hoping to have something up and running next year. Once that's up and running, I think we can get serious about using the results. Um, specifically, we can borrow some techniques from statistics and probability assessment. And in particular, Ryan has been using the Briar score, which gives you a concrete measure of a panel's predictive ability. It's the mean squared error of all of your predictions. So the lower the score, the better your predictions are. Simple. So I think my basic hope is that confronting your own inaccuracies will, will force an evolution of your model for attacker behavior, and that that evolution will trend towards a more accurate and a more unified understanding of attacker behavior. And I think there are certainly some challenges around creating events that can actually be measured, um, but we think there's enough here to get started, including in some of the more challenging areas we face at Project Zero that we referred to earlier. And importantly, I think that um, participation in this panel would actually incentivize better information sharing of any data related to the events that we're trying to forecast. Should be a nice side effect. So what we want to build is a crystal ball for vulnerability disclosure, and that's the, the expert panel-based qualitative forecasting. So we're gonna ask questions like, will this proof of concept be observed in active attacks in the next month? Will the vulnerability details released today be turned into an exploit in the next week? Will the zero day vulnerability in a certain product be found in active exploitation in the wild in the next quarter? And we fully expect to get these predictions wrong a lot as a panel. But by asking these questions, we're aiming to unify our understanding of attacker behavior. And by doing so, we're aiming to improve the, the disclosure debate. So if you're interested in being an expert on our crystal ball panel, please reach out to let me know. Otherwise, if you take one thing away from this presentation, it would have to be make predictions of your own. Your ability as security experts to make good predictions, despite the immense unknowns we face in this field is critically important. And the way to get good at that is to practice and to keep score. So uh, unfortunately, we, we haven't solved the, the vulnerability disclosure debate today, uh, but I hope you found this perspective interesting or, or challenging in some way, and I hope you're excited about qualitative forecasting like me. Um, thanks again to the, the first conference organizers, and thank you all very much for, for listening to my talk today. It's a pleasure. So thank you so much, Ben. And uh, we have plenty of questions here. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, so let's get started with that. Um, I, will, I, will, I will throw uh, in order they arrived there. I will try to find if it, those some have some uh, uh, correlation, maybe do it if they have uh, uh, making just one. But I will start with David Heard. Uh, with the disclosure time, would you in the future include more details for verification tests, more than exploits, capability itself, openness for proactive defenders? 
Yeah, good question. Um, so I think it's really hard to separate the two. And this is one thing we've, we've learned is that um, when a patch is released and you want to sort of check if you're affected by a particular issue or you want to verify if a patch is actually working as intended, um, we have certainly the ability to, to build verification tooling, which is essentially the proof of concept repurposed as a trigger with um, perhaps some better logging or um, integration into um, you know, maybe an XML based output format or something like this that you can automate. Um, but the key point is that the difference between that tool and a POC is actually fairly minimal. Um, certainly in terms of the POC triggers that we're often, the, often releasing. And that's one thing I think we've, we haven't done a good job of is describing the terminology, the difference between what is a productized exploit that can actually be used versus a proof of concept exploit that kind of works in a lab versus a trigger that just sort of demonstrates an issue um, versus just some uh, lightweight details. Um, and one thing we do know is that the, the regardless of the level of details we share, attackers are incentivized to analyze the patch and to work out what the bug is themselves from the patch details. So even if we're not releasing any details, uh, the truth is that attackers will still learn those details. They are incentivized to, to learn those details. So it's just an interesting side point on that. Good question. Okay, a uh, question for Art Minion. Uh, how silent is a silent patch? Right. Well, I think that's related to uh, <laughs> uh, what I've just, just mentioned. Is, um, silent patches are silent for defenders, but they're not silent for attackers. Attackers are very skilled at um, reversing engineering patches to, to assess the root issue. Um, having the, the details of the vulnerability public, um, we have you know, reasonable claims to say that that's saving a matter of hours, not days, um, for attackers. Um, and so when a silent patch occurs, defenders do not have the resources nor the motivation to actually go and study the details of the patch. Um, they need uh, better ways to consume information, actionable information that they can use to defend their systems. So that's a big asymmetry. That's where we think that if we were to end up in a world where we can't talk about the details of a, a vulnerability in a timely manner, that's actually favors attackers because it slows defenders down and attackers are going to get that information anyway. Uh, just a, a comment, another question. Uh, this was a fantastic review and I greatly appreciate it from uh, Matt Stemper. I appreciate that. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Jessica, uh, do you find the 90 day deadline to be sufficient or can you see this changing in the future? Yeah. Um, I did foreshadow that a bit. So we don't have any active plans, like immediate plans to, to change the 90 day value. There's two sides of this. There's, there's the positive side where there are certain technologies, certain vendors that are doing so well that we think um, that they could probably quite consistently achieve something lower than a 90 day deadline. Uh, there are also a few areas where um, we have like a long tail in terms of our ability as an industry to respond. I'm thinking like uh, microcode, patches or firmware patches, um, uh, expanding out into the IoT world, et cetera, the, the, there is a long tail of, of issues that I would probably struggle right now to, to make a 90-day um, deadline consistently. Um, the vision, I think, um, 90 days, uh, let's rephrase this. I think if I was to make a prediction, let's say 30 years out, we'll look back at our time today and look back at that 90-day figure and just it will boggle the mind that security bugs aren't patched in a number of minutes or hours. But that's the time frame. eventually we will be talking about. Um, and how we incentivize the, the research and development that needs to happen, the innovation that needs to happen to, to bring the world to that place, that's a great question. Um, so fine tuning the 90 days may or may not be enough to, to incentivize that innovation, but that should be the vision. It's like, uh, there's, there's no good reason why we can't fix all of our systems, hardware, um, firmware, software, in a, a, a timely manner. Thank you. So, have you considered from Perry? Uh, have you considered to open a time gap between the 90 days deadline for disclosure and the day in which the exploit, the POC, uh, especially for the trivial RCEs, in published? If not, why? So we think we we did incorporate feedback from vendors that they were concerned about patch adoption and the, the fact that um, even um, 
vendors that have a very good reputation for for um, delivering patches in a timely manner and for their users to be patched um, or to, to take that patch. Um, they were giving us feedback that it still takes, you know, a number of weeks, uh, potentially even months for the ecosystem as a whole to, to reach sort of a, a saturation of a patch adoption. Um, how we incorporated that earlier in our 2020 policy update was to essentially do a fixed 90 day deadline um, so that regardless of the day that we, regardless of when that issue is patched, we're always going to release the details at 90 days. And so what we're hoping is that um, if a vendor then is patching an issue uh, uh, in 30 days or 45 days, then they have more soak time for the patch to be adopted before that point of the details becoming public. Um, so that's, um, there's more details on the Project Zero blog and uh, uh, policy update 2020 entry. Um, but um, I think that's the approach we're trying to take right now. Um, uh, eventually, whether there is some sort of um, uh, tiered classification staging of uh, the level of details being released. I think that's in the mix and it's been discussed constantly, but it's all about um, trying to find the best approach for, for user security and, and really hone in on that, that what is optimal. And it's, it's sometimes a separate discussion between what is optimal and what is going to keep the most people happy. Um, and that's, that's the harder part of our job is um, there is certainly a, a degree of balancing of uh, user out user risk outcomes to business priorities that we all have to take and there's politics around that of too of course so um, it's going to be an ongoing evolution of the the policy settings i think yeah uh anonymous anonymous attendee uh why can't you disclose a 90 days but wait three weeks after disclosure to post a poc or GP technical content to give customers a chance to get the fix. It's kind of comment. Yeah, I, I think yeah, I think that's essentially addressed in the the the, the previous answer. Is um, yeah. yeah, it's something we're looking at. We think that the current policy update of 2020 does actually in, in, incorporate that sufficiently, but um, we're still uh, looking at this for 2021 and beyond. Okay. Uh, from an art minion, uh, appreciate the reasons for a narrow embargo scope, but uh, how does the the account for widely used components like upstream libraries or protocols? Yeah, so we, we tend to, um, in that situation, we still report the bugs upstream and we work with the upstream maintainer to decide you know, what's best for their downstream ecosystem. And what we found is that the, the upstream is in a, in a better position generally um, to initiate downstream notification in the way that's best for their ecosystem. And so some upstreams do take uh, the approach of, of forming their own vulnerability embargo, and we let them do that I mean, you know, within the parameters of our disclosure policy. Um, but if an upstream vendor would prefer to just get the patch out publicly, then we also support that. So essentially, we don't think that security researchers should be making that determination about what's in the best interest for for, for somebody's given ecosystem. We want to work with the upstream on, on that to, to get to a, a good result. Um, I think we have been pretty passive in that space, and it's an area where we perhaps could be showing more leadership than we than we have in the past. Um, and I think experimentally, I guess, through, through throughout the, the number of bug reports we have had, um, uh, given the characteristics of opportunistic reuse, um, I actually favor the um, openness approach to actually get the patch out publicly as soon as possible, rather than to try and maintain these awkward large embargoes between lots of different cloud companies or something like this. Um, that doesn't seem to get as good results in my experience. I will, I will jump in a few questions and just get uh, the Jerwin's question because he's uh, saying that it's following up on our, our question. So sometimes vulnerable leads to discovering structural problems in many products. Does that happen often or do you how do you handle that? It, it does happen often in the sense that we have a very um, intertwined ecosystem of software. And this is part of the motivation for Project Zero. It's, it's um, not possible just to look at um, a modern technology stack and just look at the bits that Google wrote. We're so intertwined and we're all relying on each other's code um, that, yeah, I think that phenomenon does happen, particularly in like a library setting. And um, we know that a lot of projects now are maintaining their own third-party repository. And so um, they have a huge 
challenge with vulnerability remediation in terms of cherry picking security fixes into their own branch, for example. Um, it's a it's a big problem, and we've certainly seen attackers take advantage of that gap where we've for example, done a lot of work on um, font security on Windows, and then starting to see some of those attackers move to um, uh, font-based attacks in browsers or um, in macOS, for example. Um, and so, yeah, certainly there is um, a, 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 a structural problem there. I, I agree with the, the, the premise. Thank you. A uh, question from Derek Shaw. Uh, many times getting a fix in 90 days isn't that hard. Getting all fixed in 90 days can be hard. You mentioned that you measure uh, the time to fix. I'm assuming that time is to list one fix. Uh, have you measured the number of fix that doesn't don't come uh, become available until uh, after your disclosure? Yeah. So it, I mean, it does happen from from time to time that we disclose the details of an issue when no fix is available. It used to happen a lot more. So when we first started applying disclosure deadlines, certain vendors were telling us, for example, that it just simply wasn't possible to fix a kernel bug in 90 days. And like the testing involved is so so rigorous, et cetera, um, that it just wasn't going to happen. Um, but we sort of looked at it and said, like, mm, we think it probably is possible, um, you know, um, given the right investments, uh, given the right sort of focus on that area, which had been left to languish for many years. Um, and so we, we saw that um, it was the sort of strict enforcement of the deadline that motivated that um, refreshed attention and investment into um, getting patches out uh, um, for even the most complicated systems in a timely manner. Um, yeah, certainly there is a long tail of issues. I think a lot of the ones that past the deadline now aren't so much because they were so complicated they couldn't be fixed within 90 days. It's normally because um, at the last minute they realized that the patch was broken and it didn't work well or something like this. Um, and that's something that um, that we are actually here as a resource. And, and if a vendor is uh, more open with us and can, can work with us on the details of that patch earlier on in the time frame, that result is much less likely to occur. Um, so that's sort of um, the, the one thing that I think would sort of clean up some of the, the long tail of issues that are still going out uh, without a patch. Okay. Uh, we, we still have uh, lots of questions here, but we will not be able to go through all of them. And, uh, uh, sure. Unfortunately, I would like to keep you talking here for longer. I will pick you one more and sure. uh, I will pick up uh, Serge's question because it's, uh, it's really about the future. So, do you feel Project Zero is enough, or should there be more activity by others? Uh, if so, what? I think we've certainly had a dream that um, that Project Zero at Google wouldn't be alone. Uh, that we could have a community of Project Zeros. That that. Uh, an organization can consider having a team like Project Zero as the pinnacle of uh, like a maturity model for building out a security organization. So once you have sort of everything else in place, um, having this this contribution to sort of uh, a, a society-wide problem, an intellect technology problem, uh, where we can all sort of take our expertise and, and share that expertise um, where it's most needed throughout the eco ecosystem, um, I think that's a great model for success. Um, I think we've learned a lot about um, running a team like Project Zero and the subtle alchemy that goes into making a team like Project Zero successful. And it's amazing what you can achieve with this, this approach, the energy that comes from it, the, uh, from the freedom of our, our researchers to pursue what they think is most important. Um, it's amazing what that unlocks. So uh, if you are out there and you're listening and um, you're working in an organization that might one day consider creating their own team like Project Zero, please, please, please reach out to, to talk to me. I'm very happy, I'm very open about sharing our experiences and creating a, a team like Project Zero at Google and how that's gonna be a little bit different for every organization. But we've learned uh, a lot about, um, about um, what makes this work. And, and I think it's a very, very special approach. I think it's super viable and I think it can have a lot of impact still in the next 10, 20 years. All right. Well, thank right, you very much, everyone. I really so appreciate much. it. Thanks, Lucy. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. Bye-bye.